Thank you all for being here tonight and taking the time out of a busy schedule, and uh, especially on a school night, and um, being willing to listen to what I have to say. The piece I'm going to read tonight is a part, it's 10 of those 100 little pieces, plus a prologue. Um, and it's um, an essay about the parallels that I began to see between this country and Vietnam in a trip to Vietnam last winter. Julie and I went over for two and a half months and had a great time, but it was also a very disturbing time. And so um, when I got home, I was able to sort of let things cook for a little bit and read this, um, or and write this essay. Before I do that, I'm going to read something that I wrote in the middle of our trip as a prologue. Before I do that, <laughs> I'm going to show you a very brief slideshow. And because I'm very interested in what happens visually and how much information is conveyed by pictures, and then how much more information is conveyed, conveyed by pictures with words. Um, I'm going to show the same slideshow again after you've had a chance to absorb some of my thoughts on the experience. So one of the important things I'd like you to ask, or like you to pay attention to tonight, is um, take a look at what the pictures mean the first time and what the photos mean the second. So we'll, uh, we'll begin. This prologue, I'm going to read a short piece called The Abbas Syndrome. This was written at the midpoint of the trip. We've been in Cambodia and Vietnam for six weeks now. We've climbed to the tops of decaying temples in sweltering heat, and we've drunk Tomb Raider cocktails in Seam Reef bars. We've frozen in the cold mists of northern Vietnamese highlands where our hotel provided an electric heater for an extra $5. We've kayaked through the weird karst islands 
of Haylong Bay, and we've ridden rickety and overcrowded buses at high speed through the narrow alleys of Mekong Delta towns. We visited Ho Chi Minh's black granite mausoleum and then walked back to our hotel against the tide of a million speeding motorcycles. We've even listened to Opera House. What has tied all these experiences together? ABBA songs. <laughs> On the beaches and the mountains flying high above the traffic and flying low in, the, in, in it, the sounds of ABBA have permeated our existence. Even the National Symphony, which, is, which had advertised a Dvorak concert, sounded as if it were covering SOS and Mamma Mia and take a chance <laughs> on me. Every loudspeaker we've walked by, and there have been a bunch of them, has been playing ABBA, or a band covering ABBA, or ABBA covering ABBA, or <laughs> drunken karaoke singers covering ABBA. I've come to loathe ABBA. <laughs> Even before three weeks ago, when I discovered there was an ABBA Christmas album, I wasn't much impressed with their music. I might have sung along with Mamma Mia once or twice, but I had to listen carefully to the lyrics and I thought the song and the band were eponymously about Abba Eben, the Israeli foreign minister. <laughs> it was an honest mistake, one that persisted until I saw the billboard for the musical in London. No matter. Now I have the entire contents of the Abba song, songbook engraved permanently on my frontal lobes, a distinguishing characteristic I'd gladly trade for a set of prison tats spelling H-A-T-E one, across one set of knuckles and L-O-B-E across the other. <laughs> but you make do with the distinguishing characteristics you have, not the ones you wish you had. Julie and I have spent long hours in beachfront cafes discussing deep philosophical questions. If Abbott is Swedish, how come they don't sound Swedish? <laughs> <laughs> when did Dvorak write Dancing Queen? <laughs> And who knew you could have a wall of sound version of Silent Night? <laughs> of course, the biggest philosophical question is why the Vietnamese haven't tossed ABBA on the ash heap of history, along with their commitment to Marxist egalitarianism. It may be nostalgia. The Americans who fought in World War II spent the rest of their lives believing Glenn Miller and Jimmy Dorsey made better music than anyone who came after them. The Vietnamese may remember ABBA songs as the music of victory and promise sounds from a time when an unheroic peace and the grinding realities of global capitalism had not yet tarnished the future. As I write this, I'm on the top floor of a tall new hotel in the city of Hue, the old capital of Vietnam. On the streets below, Lexuses and BMWs push through masses of motorcycle riders and street vendors. The shouts of cyclo drivers are drowned out by the chanted lyrics of Fernando. I can see half a dozen half-completed high-rises in the neighborhood and the Vietnamese flag atop Hue's citadel, looking much as it did for three weeks in 1968 when the Viet Cong forces held the city against an American counterattack. The situation on the ground is different now. Yesterday we walked through the citadel with a few thousand other tourists, looking at the restored imperial compound, inspecting the bullet holes, and shrapnel marks where they had not yet been plastered over. We walked through temples and theaters and the offices of the mandarins, through the ruins of the emperor's residence and the building where his harem had been housed. Then we walked back to our hotel, through the shouted pleas for our business from hundreds of souvenir shop owners and postcard sellers and cyclo drivers, while Abba, omnipresent, counted cadence. Okay, that was kind of an upfront impression. And once we got home, we got home to snow on the ground and, and 30 below zero and sitting beside the wood, wood stove with a cup of tea. Um, and one of the ways that I write is to sort of let these things kind of sift together in my mind until they, they turn into something different. And um, 
About a month after I got home, I started on this essay, and it took me about a month to write. It's called Vietnam is Our Future. It's, re it's in 10 parts, so I'm going to read the one through 10 uh, as kind of line breaks. One. In the fall of 2010, it's still possible to buy two round-trip plane tickets from the west coast of the United States to Vietnam for $2,000. Once there, it's cheaper than staying home. A clean hotel room with a shower and toilet costs two people $15 to $25 and includes breakfast. Lunch can be locally grown fruit, and it's hard to eat a dollar's worth. A lavish dinner for two costs $10. Beer is cheap and good. Wine is expensive and not good at all. <laughs> of course, a lot of times a beer sounds good with lunch. Beer doesn't go with mangoes or papaya or pineapples or bananas. It goes with curry or a seafood hot pot or braised pork ribs or prawns and tamarind sauce. Sometimes you get hungry near a tall hotel with a rooftop restaurant where menu prices are in dollars. The tables have bouquets and even the chairs wear tablecloths. So you can spend money as if you were a rich American tourist. Even with Vietnamese inflation running at 12% in 2010, being a rich American in Vietnam isn't nearly as expensive as being a rich American in Venice or London. But if you're a Vietnamese farmer in the fall of 2010, you're paying more for basic necessities such as food and fuel than you were in 2009, and a lot more than you were in 2008 because inflation in 2009 was 24%. The reason, reason for this inflation has been an invasion of foreign capital, some brought in by tourists, but most brought in by people building infrastructure for more tourists. Earlier rounds of inflation have come with the sweatshops and electronics factories built when the Vietnamese government opened its human resources to international capitalism. The government doesn't call it capitalism. They call it enhanced communism. And sure enough, the government takes a generous cut from the new factory builders and the new factory workers and anyone else who wants to invest in Vietnamese land or resources. But tourism is regarded as the real cash cow. Neighboring Thailand has made an art form of tourism, building whole cities of hotels on islands that once held only rubber and coconut plantations. The Vietnamese are following their example. They too want $800 a night hotel room and sex tourists and people who will order Armani suits from people not named Armani. They ignore signs that Thailand's tourist industry has been overbuilt with half empty hotels lining its beaches even before the crash of 2008. People hoping to get in on the ground floor of the next best place are waving their money, and the government admits anyone with the price of admission. Vietnam is like Thailand, only its beaches aren't as crowded with tourists. That's a good thing, at least in the eyes of the tourists, who could be a self-loathing species. <laughs> but not all tourists are looking for the perfect deserted beach, the most primitive trek, or the best curry dish in the world. Not all of them are looking for low-priced art or antiques. Not all of them are looking to lie drunk on a sun-drenched beach chair for two weeks. Some of them are looking for their youth. And in Vietnam, some of them can pinpoint the spot where they saw it last. Two. I didn't take the first chance I had to go to Vietnam, that was in May of 1968 when I graduated from high school. <laughs> Some of my classmates had joined the Marines that spring and they went from commencement to boot camp. As a, college student, as a college student, I didn't have to worry about going to war until my junior year when a draft lottery was instituted. The night of the lottery, my college roommate and I purchased a six pack of Rolling Rock, a bag of Doritos, and two cans of Bean Dip. Party. <laughs> Our lives were tied to the numbers that were picked for us, but we didn't understand that. We each opened a beer, scooped up gobs of bean dip with our Doritos, and turned on the radio. The lottery started. The second date called was my roommate's birthday. His draft number was two. 
the party was over. My roommate enlisted rather than be drafted into the inf infantry and ended up going to language school and learning Japanese. He spent his war on Okinawa, eavesdropping on Japanese military communication. Once out of the army, he became an auto mechanic in Philadelphia, probably the only auto mechanic in Philadelphia capable of reading Toyota shop manuals in their original language. <laughs> My own number was 117, selective service drafted to 113 that year. Vietnam didn't teach me Japanese, but it shaped me. It gave me a deep distrust for the powerful and demented old man of my government. It derailed my plans to go to law school and become wealthy and live in a gated subdivision and learn to play golf and eventually become one of those old men. I couldn't articulate these thoughts at 18, but I did sense that Vietnam pulled my life out of its ordained path and made it more alienated and thoughtful than it should have been. Though invisible, it was always there, always exerting an influence. It was like discovering that you were adopted and that your real parents were Vietnamese. Who knew? Three. Julie and I fly into Saigon from Boise on November 17, 2010. It's a 23-hour trip. We are jet-lagged and confused. We get ripped off right away by a taxi scam. It costs us $35 to be delivered to the wrong hotel. It should have cost us $10 to be de delivered to the right one. It's our first encounter with the Vietnamese economic policy. It will remain in our minds during all subsequent transactions in Vietnam. The good news is that over the next two months, we will save far more than the $25 we have lost to the taxi scam. Paranoids make hard bargainers. And we refuse to be good-willed American tourists, free with our dollars and excited about mailing souvenirs home. Instead, we look for the next person who might trick us and take our money. I take the lead in this matter, refusing offers for treks and tours and motorcycle taxi drivers to the best hotel in town. We're not rich American tourists, I say. We're poor American tourists. There's no way to translate poor American tourists into Vietnamese. <laughs> American tourists get to Vietnam on jet planes from a country that lets its citizens leave and then return. They have carbon footprints that Paul Bunyan can't match. They have cards that pull wads of money from ATM machines. When a poll was taken of young people in Southeast Asia, asking them what they most desired in life, the majority wanted an ATM card. So we walk instead of ride around Saigon. We do not take a tour. For reasons of claustrophobia, we do not visit the Ku Chi tunnels used to shelter a Viet Cong battalion during the war. We consult the guidebook and walk around our crowded neighborhood. We visit the Museum of Fine Arts and the war rooms under the presidential palace of the defunct Republic of South Vietnam. We find some good restaurants and once in an air-conditioned coffee shop where even the prices and once, an air-conditioned coffee shop where even the prices are modeled on Starbucks. Saigon is a city of seven or eight or nine million. Motorcycles are the preferred form of transport. Most intersections lack traffic lights. Five or six streams of traffic, 50 motorcycles wide, move through each other without as many collisions as you'd expect. The decibel level is in the hearing damage range. Our hotel is comfortable and on a neighborhood, in a neighborhood of restaurants and shops, but the size of Saigon, its traffic, its noise, the beggars displaying Agent Orange mutated children, and the warnings in our guidebook of motorcycle thieves make us want to go south through the Mekong Delta to the island of Phu Quoc. Four. Life on Phu Quoc. Up at dawn, watch the sunrise off the balcony. Walk down to the restaurant, have a coffee. Have another coffee. Walk a mile along the beach, or until you pass 100,000 lost flip-flops, whichever comes first. Walk back, have lunch, start a new book on the Kindle, feed the tan, swim in the crashing surf, have a beer, have dinner, 
finish the new book on the Kindle. Watch the evening thunderstorm march across the water on legs of lightning. When the rain hits, head for the suite for the night. Go to sleep to thunder. Dream of war. Rinse. Repeat. We stay at a small boutique hotel on a secluded southern beach of the island. Our suite is all teak and marble and beveled glass. It would be luxurious, except there's no electricity after 10 p.m., no television anytime, no hot water, even though our bathroom has a jacuzzi tub inset into its marble surfaces. Not much water pressure. It would take all day to fill the tub. But the shower dribbles enough cool water to wash off the salt after a day at the beach. Julie and I don't normally stay at boutique hotels, but our hotel wasn't planned to be boutique. It was supposed to be much larger, with a dozen or so bungalows built out behind the hotel. Our suite, I decide, is the owner's intended residence. The common areas, the kitchen, the restaurant, and gift shop are all built for the crowds that will come with phase two. Phase two is not going to happen. Work has yet to start on the bungalows or on a good water system or on the power lines to run 20 aircon units. Meanwhile, phase one is deteriorating. Despite the efforts of a small army of landscapers, beach attendants, waitresses, and bartenders, from the balcony I see peeling paint and the balding thatch of aging beach umbrellas. The hotel's two jet skis sit rusting and unused in a litter-filled storage bay behind an artisan-crafted rock wall from the restaurant. But the crippled luxury of our hotel suits both our sensibilities and our budget. The food is beyond good, with an expert massage and an expert massage on the beach cost three dollars. Long walks along the coastline don't cost anything except time and sweat, and reveal more beaches and more shoals of plastic, and now and then a single standing wall of a collapsed house, a remnant from the time before the war. Five. At the end of World War II, the population of Vietnam was less than 25 million. Now, it's 90 million. Population density is 628 people per square mile, twice that of China. 70% of present-day Vietnamese were not born when the Vietnam War ended in 1975. It's a country of young and hopeful people, and there's no thought that they will ever run out of resources to exploit or markets to sell to. But we see lots of inflation impoverished old people, lots of unemployed young ones, lots of people selling lottery tickets, lots of new plastic crap in the markets on its way to becoming the old plastic crap that marks the high tide lines. Every year the new market economy grows 7% and that growth is seen as proof that things will get better and better and better until everyone has an ATM card. The communists need to change the party to something more American. They're a new hereditary elite, feeding off an ability to pass laws in their favor and siphon tax dollars for their own companies and appoint family members to high positions in corporations or governments. At street level, you pass rows of shops, all selling the same goods. Hotel districts are expanding in beach towns. You can spot them by the construction cranes. The buildings are going up are monsters with hundreds of rooms. Under their skeletal shadows, res restaurants park children on the sidewalk. And it's not uncommon to have tiny smiling girls thrust menus under your nose five or six times in a single block. Fans of capitalism tout its capacity for creative destruction, but more than once in Vietnam, I had the thought that what was being destroyed was a nation's young people. They compete with each other on a life and death basis, and it made me glad that there was an ocean between Vietnam's young people and ours. Six, a temporary incursion into Cambodia. Kampot is a small, lazy town on an estuary that leads to the Gulf of Thailand. Food is good. Our hotel is clean and new. A population of English-speaking expatriates is happy to recount sad life stories 
and local survival tips for the price of a beer. The honey bar, whose outside sign has a dissipated poo bear hoisting a beer mug, is for sale for $5,000, and that includes the girls who work there. We leave Camp Pot thinking we should have stayed maybe a year longer. I've been a bartender. I could do it again. We escape Phnom Penh as quickly as we can, distressed by the taxi driver's incessant cries of, killing fields? You want to go killing fields? and the discovery that our hotel had been built on the site of one of the Khmer Rouge's slaughterhouses. We tour Angkor Wat and the small percentage of the temples that surround it. A thousand years ago, these jungle-covered ruins were the biggest city in the world. Ten miles on a side, home to a million people. It shows the scale of our own time that two to three times that many were killed in the Khmer Rouge genocide alone. When we were in Kampot, we met a, a down-at-his-heels Australian running a small-time tour business with his Cambodian in-laws. He had explained that for us the he had explained for us the pathological laid-back attitude of Cambodians. Most of them had their whole families killed by the Khmer Rouge. They live with no sense of the future. Seven. Hanoi is not laid back. It's the capital of a huge and diverse but officially unified nation. Although in our short time in the capital, we see evidence of deep divisions between rich and poor, young and old, north and south, mountain and lowland, ethnic Chinese, and ethnic Vietnamese. Communism still has a religious heft in Hanoi, even as global capitalism pays the bills. A few of the self-sacrificing heroes of 1975 are still in power, and younger middle-aged bureaucrats still pay lip service to the people's struggle against American imperialism. A still younger generation of communists is composed of a familiar international breed, intelligent but unimaginative young people who do all the right things in high school and college to worm their way into the existing power structure. Once there, they display a commendable respect for enforcing rules, following procedures, and advancing their careers. But like the generation before them, they have little ideological background when it comes to keeping their fingers out of the cookie jar. And Vietnam's corruption indicate, index matches that of Ethiopia, Mongolia, and Tanzania. A local magazine survey of Hanoi residents reveals that what Hanoians want most in life is not an ATM card. They want a car. This in spite of the fact that if everyone in Hanoi who wants a car gets one, there will be no room, none, on the already gridlocked streets. One good thing the national government has done is to build housing for the homeless. And down the coast from Hanoi, there are countless five to 10 story concrete buildings going up around every town. Much of Vietnam is made up of limestone mountains, and those mountains are being ground into powder, and the powder is being mixed with water and gravel and poured into forms. There are a limited number of forms, one for family housing, one for multifamily housing, one or two for tourist hotels, and so on. Different colored ceramic facades distinguish one building from another. In the future, there will be no mountains left in the country, in their places will be a vast gray hive, a labyrinth a thousand miles long, one with caste specific cells for farmers, shopkeepers, soldiers, party members, and tourists. Eight. The week we arrive in the Trang, it's been listed by an international tourist organization as one of the 10 worst beach towns in the world. <laughs> We don't know that when we check into the Havan Hotel, where friendly people usher us to a nice $20 room that comes with the best breakfast we'll have in Vietnam. We don't know that when we discover the Louisiana Brew House across the shore highway from our hotel, where you can sit by the pool all day, drinking beer and kindling your way through a Russian novel, and eat a superb lunch at poolside or in the attached restaurant. We don't know that when we walk through the town's bizarre beachfront sculpture garden in 70 degree sunshine, or when we visit its restored Cham Dynasty towers. 
We especially don't know that when we find an inexpensive Indian restaurant on a narrow back street right across from an ATM. <laughs> what could Natrang have done to have gotten itself on a 10 worst list? It's the most touristed place we visit in Vietnam, but we've become hardened to the beggars and street hawkers and sidewalk touts, and they have long ago learned to read the subtle signals of that hardening, and they mostly leave us alone. The Trang has a half dozen half completed high rise hotels, and some of the completed hotels in town are empty, even though the weather is good. If you dine upstairs at the Indian restaurant, you look across the street to a clothing factory where the teenaged workers get ready for bed right next to their sewing machines. They look out at you with eyes a hundred years old. They see you looking back at them, and you both realize how unbridgeable the gap is between you how improbable for each the gaze of the other. The blinds come down with a snap. You go back to your beer and lamb vindaloo. Perhaps the worst thing that Detrang has done is to sprawl into a miles-long high-rise carnival on a beautiful white half-moon beach. It doesn't help that the beach lies between two fog-topped mountain headlands and faces a soft blue bay full of dark green islands. There's a headless chicken tendency in the tourist industry, one that keeps on keeping on, even when it's clear the tourist infrastructure threatens to kill the thing that attracted tourists in the first place. And the Trang isn't quite there yet. It won't get there, either. We still want to go back in 10 years, not just for another week around the pool at the Louisiana Brew House, but to see what becomes of a place built on the ability from all over the world to buy cheap airline tickets in a time when airline tickets won't be cheap. In the mountain town of Dele okay, okay, sorry, that's the end of that. This is number nine. <laughs> in the mountain town of Dalat, home to Vietnam's wine industry, a university, a replica of the Eiffel Tower, an astonishing botanical garden, and the summer palace of Vietnamese at Vietnam's last emperor, we strike up a conversation with our waiter in the restaurant across the street from our hotel. He speaks good English and acts happy to see us. He's 21 years old and goes to Dalat University. He grew up on his parents' coffee farm. His name is Kong, he says, like King Kong, and he flexes his muscles and laughs. He asks us where we're from, and we say America, and we ask where he's from, and he says he's from his mother. <laughs> it's a joke we've heard a lot in Vietnam. So we ask where his mother's from, and he says his parents have always lived in the mountains north of Dalat. Does he see his parents? Not often. They work the farm. When Kong isn't working as a waiter, he needs to study. Does he? Uh, Kong wants to meet us for coffee in the morning. He has some questions he wants to ask, and we reluctantly agree. I tell Julie that if he tries to sell us something or get us to go on a trek, I'm out of there. But Kong wants information, not money. How can I get rich, he asks, <laughs> even before the coffee comes. I'm not the person to ask, I tell him. <laughs> I revert to an old cultural narrative and tell him to work hard and save his money and do everything he can to stay out of debt, advice that doesn't even work in America any longer. Finally, I say, Kong, some money is good, but you can have too much. Make sure you don't own things. Don't let things own you. Make sure you own things. Don't let things own you. He doesn't like this advice. <laughs> Interesting, he says. I ask about him about his family's farm, and he says it's on a steep hillside. Each coffee plant has to be watered by hand in dry season, he says. He has one brother and three sisters. His brother will run the farm. His sisters will be married to other farmers. He's the oldest son, and for that reason, he was chosen to go to the university. He asks how old I am. When I tell him 60, he says that his parents are younger than me, but they look much older. He says 
He would like to own a car someday when he's a hotel manager in Saigon. You will never be rich if you buy a car, I tell him. He doesn't like, like this advice either. <laughs> Julie compliments him on his command of English and apologizes for our not knowing Vietnamese. You learn Vietnamese, he asks. Why? Then he says, I have to learn English. English is my future. Tim. There's little awareness in Vietnam that the world might run short of oil or that the economy won't grow by 7% every year forever. There is no understanding that recent floods in the central part of the country might be related to changes in the world climate or that the rice fields of the Mekong Delta could be under seawater by the year 2100. There is no fear that tourists might stop coming from collapsing economies or that even tourists that tourism might become morally unaffordable in a world of scarcity. Population growth is seen as a problem by a few government officials, but when Vietnam, Vietnam's official two-child policy was recently relaxed, it took only a year for the population growth rate to almost double. When it's not being used for, as space for concrete buildings, the whole country is being cleared and terrorists to grow vegetables. Vietnam will still have agriculture if industrialism and globalism and world currencies get tossed on the ash heap of history. But it's not hard to imagine the great tourist hotels becoming high-rise version, versions of the overgrown temples at Angkor Wat. As for the ambitious young people who have put their faith in our cherished Western narrative of hard work and accumulated wealth, I think there will come a time when they will be angry and disappointed for themselves and their families. At least they won't starve, I think. But then I remember that when the Japanese confiscated the Vietnamese rice crop in 1945, two million of them did. Near the end of our time in Vietnam, Julie and I take a, a hike to a high peak outside of the city of Dalat. On our way back down, we stop at a roadside cafe, and a wizened old woman sells us two cans of Coke and sits down at our table. She looks at our wedding rings and smiles. How many children, she asks. None, says Julie. Zero. I try to say that we're content to be uncle and aunt, but that doesn't translate well. Mm -hmm. I have 11 children, she says. My children have 10 children. She asks me my age, and I tell her. I'm 58, she says. I pay her for her Coke, or for, for the Cokes, and get up to leave. No children, she says. No grandchildren. She shakes her head in pity and makes a face so sad that it looks like she's crying. I turn away from her so she can't see that I'm making the same face. I want to tell her to save her tears for her children and grandchildren. I want to tell her that 90 million children and grandchildren is too many for her country, and that the airplanes loaded with tourists will not always show up. I'd like to tell her that the South Korean and Chinese and American investors in her country are going to want impossible returns on their investments. I want to tell her that her children and grandchildren are already someone else's wealth, and that her mountains are being eaten. I want to tell her that America lost the war and there's no need to adopt our values. I want to tell her things that would be impossible to translate even if I spoke her language or if she knew more than a few words of mine. <laughs>